continuing our journey into the labyrinth and into the human brain. And we're looking at different parts of the brain with different parts of the Bible. And I promise you something today, that when you walk out of this room, I will give you something very exciting. It's a sock knocker, you know, you knock your socks off kind of thing. And, and I think it's a really interesting one. And uh, you'll have a sock knocker before you uh, leave here. Um, but what we've done in, in looking at the brain and looking at the Bible and so forth and so on, we found much in the hippocampus. The hippocampus of the brain. Do you know what's an amazing thing? I went on the internet yesterday and I was looking through America Online and I looked at the word, I put in hippocampus on the search engine. They have hippocampus clubs. I didn't realize it. Hippocampus organizations. There'll be a meeting of the hippocampus club, you know, and all this. And because scientists and all, because this is the place of memory. It is the place of recall. And, 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 and that makes it very interesting as part of what we have found. And if you look on um, uh, the material that I gave you, and I hope that you brought your material with you, and if you would, you'll find that, first of all, the hippocampus is on 16B, uh, 16, I guess 16B, yeah, 16B. And there, the hippocampus, you find out that is the medial margin, which is the hem of the cortical mantle. And the word mantle means cloak or garment. And so we found that it is the hem of the garment that is talked about in Matthew 14, 36, when it says, if you touch the hem of the garment, as many as touch the hem of the garment are healed. That was interesting. In addition to that, in the third sentence on page 16b, you find a reference to Amon's horn as part of the... Uh, as part of the hippocampus. And Amon, as we found out on page 28, if you go to, to page 28 of the material that I gave you, we find a connection. We find Amon, uh, if you look down in the third category down, Amon, and you've got Amon, A-M-M-O-N, and then we find A-M-M-O-N, which is exactly the same spelling as we find in the hippocampus, is connected to Amen, which you've been saying in church all of your life. You didn't know you were talking about yourself. Amen. And, and so we find, we find that. And then we find a connection because in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus is called by the Bible, Amen, which is very interesting now. Because if Jesus is the amen, which the Bible says Jesus is, then amen is Amon. And now we can understand how Jesus can say, at that time you will know I am in you. And if Jesus is a Amon, we find out that Amon is actually, his symbol is the pyramid. And he is entombed in the pyramid. So now we're bringing together the pyramid, we're bringing together Amon, amen, Jesus, all of this business. And not only did we do that. But we found out something else that's interesting. We found out that if you look under Amon there, where it says Amon, Amon, and Amen, thank you, you'll find out that he is also identified with Zeus. You see that? He's identified with Zeus. And what's interesting about identifying him with Zeus is the fact that Zeus rode Pegasus and threw the lightning bolt. And Jesus is supposed to come back on the white horse, which is Pegasus. And Jesus says his coming is like a flash of lightning from the east to the west. So now we've got a connection with Jesus, with Zeus, with Amon, with the whole business. And it comes out of the hippocampus of the brain. Now what was else was interesting about that? If you look on page 28 of the material I gave you, you see that Amon or Amen is the man with the ram's head. And the ram became very, very powerful or very, very important in this. Because Amon is the Ram of God, Jesus is the Lamb of God, and it says in the Bible they provided a Ram, and we know Ares is the Ram. But what I found very interesting is the fact that the hippocampus is also the place of memory. And there we find the Ram of God. Now look at page 30, and you'll find the Ram, Ares. And you find it's connected at the bottom of page 30 with Ramayana, which Rama, which is also the ram head God. Now we've, we've embraced not only Muslims, we've embraced Christians, we've embraced Jews, we've embraced Arabs. Now we're embracing uh, here Hindus, Ramayana. And now we'll embrace something else. Look at page 31. The place of memory in your computer is called... 
Uh, how cool is that? They'll say, well, I mean, who, who would know? I mean, uh, these guys that wrote uh, thousands of years ago wouldn't know that computer memory is going to be called RAM just like it is in the brain. Oh, yes, they did. Yes, they did. They did know. Sorry. He's something else. You see, when we, when we look at words and you look at, and you look at how things are laid out for you, things are laid out for you to find. Yeah. If I told you, I mean, how many times, who's the most powerful man on the East Coast in the gambling mecca of Atlantic City? What's his name? Trump. This is so... Who's the most powerful man in the gambling mecca in Las that. Vegas? What's his name? When? <laughs> I said, well, these are all coincidences. For thousands of years, when people used to go into meditation, they would chant this word. Oh, oh, oh. And as they were chanting Om, the electrical energy would rise up through the spine and go through chakras, which are actually resistors. These are, electri these are resistors to the electrical energy, which would go up the spine. So some guy comes along and he discovers a theory that measures electrical resistance. And what is his name? Oh, it's Ohm's law. <laughs> now, what would have happened if his name had been Sid Schwartz? What the, would they have been chanting in the temples of Buddha? Schwartz. <laughs> Makes sense? Because it's all laid out for you. It's all there. So in other words, this is hard to conceive, but there is an intelligence that lived 6,000 years ago that has taught us and laid all of these things out for you to understand when you reach the point where you could evolve. Okay. So we found in the hippocampus of the brain memory. We found Jesus. We found Amon. We found the pyramid. Because right at the place of the, of the hippocampus, at the point where the spine ends and connects to the neck, there's a thing called the hypoglossal nerve. And the hypoglossal nerve is the 12th nerve, and it exits at the point of the pyramid. Actually, there's two pyramids up there. This is inside of you, and the olive. And that, of course, we understand how you anoint your head with olive oil. You don't have somebody put a greasy finger smeared all over your forehead, which we do, because this is as far as we've ever gotten with religion. Oh, now I'm saved. I got grease on my head. This is really going to turn this God on up there. That's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is that when you start meditating and the energy starts to rise, the oil flows up, hits at the hypoglossal, uh, hypoglossal nerve, and it then hits the forehead with the oil, and you've anointed your head with olive oil. Now, what do we find? We found the hippocampus is the, hippocampus is the, the center of memory. We found that Ram is the name of the god of the hippocampus according to the dictionaries and according to the, uh, the, the medical evidence. And we found that Ram is the name that we use for random access memory in the computers. And we found that Rama is the god of the Hindus. And we found the most powerful holy day in the Islam is Ramadan and, mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. And so we said, well, gee, these, all of these things cannot be coincidences. So what I wanted to look at now was another thing that's interesting and part of the your anatomy and uh, very popular today because it produces something that is sold in stores all over the place. Your local uh, uh, drugstore or, or health food store sells something called melatonin. Mm -hmm. I don't suggest you buy it because mm -hmm. you're buying uh, melatonin from some bull instead of, you know, producing your own. Melatonin mm -hmm. is produced by a gland in the center of your brain called the pineal gland. It's pronounced pineal, okay? And the pineal gland produces melatonin when you're in darkness, when you're sleeping, melatonin flows into your body, okay? Now, this is interesting because the pineal gland associates metaphysically with Aries, which is the ram of God. God provides the ram. Now, how does it associate? In the spring, we're, we're running through the, the winter right now. In the spring, the sun, by the trajectory of the earth, will appear to enter Aries. When the sun consumes Aries, the ram has been sacrificed. That's the burnt offering. And when that occurs, we pass over from winter to spring. It, it, it doesn't require any religious training, spiritual training. It doesn't require you to believe anything. If you hang around till April, you'll see it. I mean, it's a fact True. that in the northern hemisphere where we live and where all this stuff is predicated, the sun will appear to rise out of the winter solstice and enter in Aries. And you have two things that occur. Either the sun consumes the ram, 
burns the ram, which is the burnt offering, or it lays down with the lamb. When the sun, when the lion lays down with the lamb, we have peace. When Aries and, and, and the sun Leo lie down together, we have spring. Well, the same thing happens in you. You have a solar plexus, and through your meditation, when the solar plexus energy rises, the fire consumes the pineal gland of the brain. That throws open the right hemisphere in the same way that in the spring, the sun moves to the right side or to the eastern sky and we have summer. Here, the solar energy moves to the right hemisphere of the brain and you move from the winter of your life to the spring, the summer of your life. It's the way it occurs, okay? And that's what goes on with the pineal gland of the brain. Now, when that is called, actually that word means pine cone. Okay. And it's the sacred pine cone. Back in the um, days of Osiris, in the temples of Osiris, in the pyramid courts, when they used to uh, place a, a dead body, they would bring the dead body in to be entombed, and they'd place a, a pine cone at the center of the forehead, because they knew what it was for. So, now, how do you see where we live here, what goes on with this pine cone? The solar fire from your body, through the energy of meditation, consumes the pine cone, which then opens up your intelligence to new understanding and new life. Where do you see that happen? All you have to do is go to the pine barrens, the forest that you live around right here, and you'll find pine cones. These pine cones are sealed, and they're opened by fire. They're opened by intense heat. And when fire hits them, they explode, and they spread the seeds of life all over the place. So the solar fire causes the pine cone to open. The solar energy for your meditation causes the pineal, or your sacred pine cone, or the pine cone in your head to open, which gives you new life. So then there's an anatomical reason for all this. There's an electrical reason for all this. It's energy. So the same way that the ram is consumed by the fire in spring, giving you springtime, the pineal gland is consumed. Now, this is an interesting thing, too. If you look um, at, well, let me see, if you look at the location of the pineal gland, I'm not very good at this kind of stuff, but anyhow, it's right there. Right in the center of your forehead. That's you, all right. There ain't question about it. Right in the center of your... In fact, uh, what medical doctors in this country used to do, just as recently as 50 years ago, is measure brain swelling by the location of the pineal gland. It was pushed over here and so forth and so on because they didn't understand what the pineal gland did 50 years ago. Yet the Bible understood. But this is the important part. What we're looking at here and what we're looking for is the connection between cherubim mm -hmm. in the Bible and cerebrum, which is your brain. And what I'm saying to you is that cherubim in the Bible and cerebrum, which is your brain, are the same thing. Where do the cerebim dwell? The cerebim dwell in the point of the brain where God, then according to the Bible, appears between the wings of the cherubim. Okay? Between the wings of the cherubim. Let me, um, if I could show you, if you look at page 10 of the material that I gave you, if you look at page 10 of the material I gave you, you'll see the wings of the cherubim. All right? Now, if you really want to see, they talk what an angel is. If you really want to see the angel, do you see that? Have you got page 10 open? Turn it upside down, and you'll see the angel. You'll see the angels with You see? That's the angel, okay? Well, what is an angel? And we've gone through this, and it's in that material that I gave you, and it's documented by Dr. Goller at uh, Goddard Space Lab. An angel is actually an angle. It is an angle of electricity that impacts your brain and causes you to think differently. And when the angle of electricity impacts your brain, it causes an arc between receptors in your brain. It then becomes an archangel or an archangel uh, as you're used to hearing it and all of this re light that is reflected from the universe comes down and it is reflected at an angle so we're looking for this god or whatever you want to call it that appears between the wings of the cherubim and if you will look here and if this is the cerebrum which is the cherubim between the wings of the cherubim or the cerebrum you have two things you have a pineal gland and you have the fornix and as we've shown you, the fornix is the place where Jesus was entombed. The fornix is the pyramid where Amon rests. The fornix is the place where the stone is rolled away. And what is interesting about the fornix, which, uh, which I've showed you before, um, the fornix of your brain is that sealed place where the invisible one comes. Now, remember, we've started all this by telling you that 
Amen is the name of Jesus in the Bible. Amun is the name of the one in the pyramid. Okay. There is only one energy which can go through the fornix of your brain. Only one energy can go through the fornix of your brain. What does medical science call that energy? If you look on page 11, you'll see it. And it's an amazing thing. And I, you know, I couldn't have written this. Somebody said, you know, did you write this? I mean, you know, look at page 11 of the brain, of, of that stuff I gave you. Immediately behind the anterior pillars of the fornix, that means the front pillars of the fornix, in front of the optic thalamus is an opening. And what is it for? For amen. Huh. Who's it for? For amen. What's Jesus called in the Bible? Amen. Amun. Amun. And it's in Stedman's medical picture. Okay. So there it is. So what is it? Well, who put that in there? Why is it in there? But it is. So the only energy that can go through there, then, is the four of it. So if we look, then, at, you know, turn to page 338 in the Bible, if you would, for a minute, so that you can see this. On 2 Kings chapter 19. 2 Kings chapter 19. Look at verse 15. Hezekiah prayed, O Lord, which dwells between the cherubims. So we're looking for God that dwells between the cherubims. And we just looked at the cerebim of the brain, and we're saying, what is it that dwells in your brain? See, it doesn't make any difference if you're religious. It doesn't make any difference if you don't believe any of this stuff. Because if you feel up here above your shoulders, there is a round thing that sits between your shoulders, mm -hmm. and inside of that is all this stuff anyhow. Sorry. It's all there. The fornix is there. The pineal is there. The cerebrum is there. The wings of the cherubims are there. The whole bit is there. Let me give you, let me give you, if you, um, I don't know what page is on. Somebody tell me what page, 1 Kings chapter 6, um, verse 27. What page is 1 Kings chapter, what is it? Look on page 296. Do you have this again? Page 296. Do you have this picture? Take a look at this picture with your left hand. All right? Or you put it in your right hand if you're left handed, whatever way you are. Take a look at that picture with your left hand or your right hand. Now look at 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 27. And he set the cherubims within the inner house, which is your skull. And they stretched forth the wings so that the wing of one touched the one wall, the right side of your head, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall, the left side of your head, and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. There's the picture. Okay. Other, and, and, uh, look. The other answer you got to this is two little fat kids with wings on them fluttering around somewhere, but I don't think you want to hear about that anymore. I think you want to be adult and say, what the heck does all of this mean? And I'm trying to tell you what all of it means. So we go between the cherubim to find the location of God, and in between the cherubim we find the location of fornix and the pineal gland of the brain. Okay, that's what's there. And, and you, you have the pictures of it. Now, the pineal gland of the brain was called by the ancient people the single eye. Have you ever heard of the god Osiris of Egypt? Can I show you something? The word OS in medical dictionaries means open. Okay? I don't think I have to tell you what the word iris means. The open eye. The single eye. Osiris. All right. Okay. You know, what's, you know what's disgusting about this is that nobody in religion knows any of this stuff. I don't understand. <laughs> but they don't. They haven't a clue. Okay. All right. So we're looking for the pineal gland. We're looking for the single eye. Now, if you look with me on page 781, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, Jesus makes a statement. Page 781, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 22. And as I said, before you leave here, I promise to give you documentation. I promise to give you something that will really be exciting to you. All right? This is something I, you'll, you'll go out of here with, and it'll be very exciting. Matthew chapter 6, 22. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye be single, if you stimulate the pineal gland, your body will fill with light. Can you prove that scientifically? Yes. Why? Because if you stimulate the pineal gland of your brain, your body fills with melatonin, and melatonin is a skin lightener. So he can say if you stimulate the pineal gland of your brain, your body will fill with melatonin, so the Bible is scientifically accurate. It's just written in symbolisms, which it says through the whole thing anyhow. Okay, so we have that. Now, let us go and see something very interesting. 
If you stimulate the pineal gland of the brain, your body will fill with light. Let's go to page 28 of the Bible. And there we'll look at Genesis chapter 32. And it's necessary to do this because you've got to see this with your own eyes or it's very difficult to believe. Genesis chapter 32, and look at verse 30. Jacob sees God face to face, and what does he call the name of the place where he saw God face to face? In the Bible, in this old book, he says, I have seen God face to face, and I shall call the place Peniel. Peniel. Huh? Okay. So Jacob calls it pineal. Now, how do we know that the pineal there and the pineal we're talking about and the single eye are the same thing? Because Jesus said, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. Jacob calls the name of the place pineal because I have seen God face to face. Go to page 995. And in page 995, look at the book of 1 John. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, this is the message. God is light. So if Jacob said, I have seen God face to face, Jacob would have to say, I have seen light, and I'll call the place pineal. And Jesus says, if your eye be single, your body will be filled with light, and the single eye is the pineal gland. That would seem pretty reasonable to me. Seem pretty logical. And I know it cannot be accepted in religious circles, but neither could Galileo. So it shows you how much credibility they have. Okay? All right. Now... This here, then, is what we're talking about. When we look at page 10, you look at the very center of your brain is this fornix, which is for amen, and the pineal gland of the brain, it is the middle chamber of the brain, which you see very clearly on the material that I gave you on page 10. <clears throat> the middle chamber. Now, if you go with me, and if you look at page 296, in 1 Kings, and I know it's pain and act to all this Bible jumping around, but it's there, and you should see it. 1 Kings chapter 6, it talks about the building of the house, and the house is the temple, and the house is the temple that's not made with hands, and the only temple that exists on the face of this earth that is not made with hands is the one in your head. This is the temple that is not made with hands. So it's talking about this. And it says in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7, and the house when it was built was built of stone made ready before so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any iron heard while it was being built. The house, this temple, is built in silence. Whoa. Silence. This house is built in silence. Now, watch it. The door for the middle chamber, verse 8, was in the right side of the house. First of all, the door for the middle chamber, which is the fornix, which is the pineal, is in the right side of the house, which is the right hemisphere of the brain. And they went up with winding stairs. Do you see one up with the winding stairs? Have you ever seen the winding stairs? Have you ever looked at the winding stairs? Go to page 27 in the material that I gave you. All right, look at page 27 of the material that I gave you, and look at the winding stairs. And they're right at the top of the page in the upper right-hand corner, okay? It's nucleic acid of the winding stairs. You know it better by that lovable name, DNA. Remember OJ? DNA. Okay? Those are the winding stairs. Those are the winding stairs that cause this energy to rise in this serpentine motion, okay? And these are the winding stairs that lead to this middle. They lead to the pineal gland of the brain and to the fornix, okay? The fornix, which is just for a man, which is in the center of the brain. Now, with me so far? Have I lost anybody? Okay. The middle chamber, the pineal gland, the fornix, and we see in the Bible that this winding motion leads upward to the middle chamber. Now, what did we find out? And, and look again on 16b. Please just look with me because I don't have to paint the neck, but just look at me. Look with me. Look, I tell you what, because there's a few, few doggone it. There's a few new people here. So let me just pause for a second and just show you something so you can go very slow with this. Matthew chapter 14, verse 36. Go to page 791. Matthew chapter 14. And look at verse 36, all right? And this is what I want to show you. Because I've showed you that 
Dura Mater, Pia Mater, and Arachnoid is the brain. That's the temple. But the New Testament, Matthew chapter 14, verse 36. Okay. And what's the matter? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Have I got the wrong one? Yeah. Is that, is that, is that Matthew? Well, I'm in the wrong book. I was just testing you to see if you were really paying attention. I knew what I was doing, he said. <laughs> Matthew chapter 14, verse 36. And as only touched the hem of his garment, and as many as touched were made perfectly whole. So you have to touch the hem of the garment. Now look at page 16B of the material that I gave you. The complex structure that forms the medial margin, which is the hem. This is from, this is from, this is from uh, uh, the, the Stedman's Medical Dictionary, the hem of the cortical. The word cortical means outer, mantle. The word mantle means cloak or garment. It's the hem of the garment. It's your brain. So as many as can touch that. And if you touch that, you'll touch the pineal. And if you touch that, you'll touch the hippocampus. And if you touch that, you'll touch the fornix. But how do you touch it? You touch it not by going to church, not by being any part of any religion. You touch it by getting out of those places. As fast as your little legs can carry you, run away from those people. And you touch that by entering within yourself and allowing the energy to roll the stone away from the fornix. And then you may tell. So so we have that, the hem of the garment. Now this is what's interesting. Now I know this is English and I know this is a, but remember a lot of these words, these are all Latin words. So you can have very consistent all over the world. But this is what's interesting to me. The hem of the garment is where Jesus is, where Amman is, where Amor is. And where was Jesus born? Beth means house. Right? La. That's just interesting. The house of the hem. <coughs> I'm just saying, think about it. Just think about it. Doesn't mean anything, but to me it does. But just think about it. <laughs> Bethlehem. Okay? So that's where he's born. Now, I want to track some words with you. And I want to track these words with you by you looking at page 349 in the Bible. And on page 349, you go to a book called First Chronicles, which is a book that we very seldom read. I mean, nobody reads it because it's just a lineage of who was messing with who and who got babies and all of this kind of thing. Anyhow, what's very interesting to me about this, if you look at First Chronicles chapter 4, I want to show you something, and this is neat. Now we're gonna, now we're you sat through all of this stuff. Now we're going to get to the good stuff. First Chronicles chapter four. Look at verse four, and Penuel, the father of Jedor. Now the first thing I want to do, and I'm going to try this. I've never done this before. We're going to put this thing on because I want to show you something. Would you? Uh, could you? Are you there? Can you see this? Well, just say yes, even if you can. Yes. Yes, everybody can say. Penuel, do you see that? Do you see what it says? It is also called Peniel. All right? It is also, now, I mean, this is out of the, Penuel is also called Peniel, which is the Peniel gland of the brain. Did you see it? Yes. All right, good. You saw it. So it works. See, this stuff works. Okay. Jeez. Turn the lights on with you. All right. Now. Read with me 1 Chronicles chapter 4. Penuel, the father of Gedor, and Ezer, the father of Husha. So far, not too interesting. These are the sons of Hur, the firstborn of Ephrata, the father of... Bethlehem. Who? Bethlehem. Who is Bethlehem related to? Peniel. Do you see the relationship between Peniel and Bethlehem? The house of the Hem, the birthplace of Christ, and the Peniel gland of the brain. Let's see if we can make this work. The place of Christ's birth is Bethlehem. That's the birthplace. No problem with that. We don't know that. Okay. Now, if you read this, you'll find out that his father is called Ephrata. And the word Ephrata means fruitful. So the fruitful gives birth, okay? to the place of Christ's birth with Bethlehem. But fruitful also gives birth to somebody else in this little paragraph, her. Okay? And her 
means hole of the viper. It is the serpent. It is the kundalini, which can save you or blow your brains out, whichever way you look at it. Okay? But this is interesting. This is the serpent. This is the kundalini. But if it's the kundalini, it has to be a female serpent because that energy that goes up your spine is feminine. Now, isn't that interesting that her, the kundalini female serpent, is related to Pineal. In fact, they're brothers. Or are they brother and sister? And that's what's interesting. Because if you'll turn to page 31 of the new material that you got today, watch this one. You ready for this? This is really neat. You see the word viper? Which is her? You see the word viper, the serpent? Go all the way over to the right and about the fourth line down, and you see to give birth. You see that? Okay, now what I want you to do is look up her, H-U-R, and the Arabic meaning of the word her, okay? If you look there, it says her, so forth. Look down the third line, from Arabic her, of Hura, the dark-eyed woman. But the dark-eyed woman from what? Look at number two one of the beautiful virgins of the Quranic paradise. The virgin, feminine aspect of the spine. But this is what blows you away. She is one of the dark-eyed women of the Quranic paradise. And if you look down, in the next one you find the Quranic is an adjective for the Koran. She is Islam. And she is the dark-eyed woman woman who is the sister of Peniel, who produces Bethlehem, the place of the hem, the place of the birth of the one you call Jesus. The dark-eyed, the dark-eyed woman. Bill, just explain yeah. what you meant by Kundalini. If, like anything else, Kundalini, which is, uh, you see, a lot of people that see that word say kundalini that's a hindu thing i'm not interested in that kundalini says that the serpentine female serpentine energy ri rises in the serpentine way up the spine impacts the pineal gland of the brain and throws open the right hemisphere of the brain there's a lot of christian people have trouble when you hear about that and i can understand that but the reason they have trouble with it is because they don't ever read this book that they carry under their arm if you open the bible and you look on page 1005 in the book of Revelation, page 1005 in the book of Revelation. You come to Revelation chapter 5, and in Revelation chapter 5, if you look at verse 1, it describes the same thing. It says, And I saw on the right hand, which is the right hemisphere of the brain, of him that sat on the throne, which is the higher consciousness, a book written within, which is within you, and on the back side, which is your spine, sealed with seven seals. Oh, that's it. Okay, so it's in the Bible. So it's not a strange thing. But here, then, you have this dark-eyed woman producing this, this, this relationship with, with, with Peniel and then producing Bethlehem. So Bethlehem is related to Peniel, and they are both related to the dark-eyed virgin woman who is of the Quran. So you got everybody involved here. And so now you can see also that they're all connected with the RAM, which is the random access memory of the hippocampus, and now you know where the high holy day of Islam is Ramadan. And, and look, it's not the first time you're hearing about a, a female in Islam. Do you know there was a beautiful girl, and she was of Islam, and when she died, there was people that said, they saw her appear, and they saw her walking about, and it became a very holy shrine. And it was in Portugal, where the Muslims actually controlled that part of the world until the Crusades, when they were driven out by the Christians. But the one that they saw was in a place called Portugal, called Fatima, named after Muhammad's daughter. 
And the Muslims used to make pilgrimages to see the Lady of Fatima. They still do. But the Muslims don't go there anymore. The Christians go there. But it's still called the Lady of Fatima. Only they've named her Mary. Okay. So anyhow, we find then the coming together of all of these things inside of the brain where there are no religions or things separated like that. Now, what do we have? And what did we do? I showed you in the Bible that the pineal gland of the brain, the single eye, the face of God, comes from her who is the serpent, the female serpent, the dark-eyed woman. The dark-eyed woman who is the serpent Kundalini and who is the sister of pineal which produces Bethlehem, the place of Christ's birth inside of you, the house of the hem, the place that you touch when you meditate and that energy rises up your spine. And I showed it to you. And you have the documentation. And you have medical documentation and scientific documentation. And you have the documentation of all of these prestigious books such as Grolier's and so forth and so on, defining all of these words. I couldn't make any of this stuff up. But now I've come to this place. I've told you. Yes, sir. It's pretty. I don't know. It's a thing in my head. It kind of explains... Uh... Yeah, come on, man. Come on, man. It kind of, it kind of explains the, the, the uh, deal with Christ being born without conception. Yes. Not a mortal thing. No, no, no. Yes, you know, by a virgin. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, you're no. right on the rut. That's fine. That's fine. Because, hey, let me, at least you were paying attention. I mean, the rest of these people didn't catch that. Yeah. <laughs> and you got it all right. That's right. Look, in the ninth month of the year, the sun by the trajectory of the Earth, appears to be born out of the constellation Virgo, the Virgin. It is born of a Virgin. In the 11th month, it appears to pass through a constellation through, called the Cross. It is crucified. And the winter solstice, it sits in the tomb of the Earth three days and three nights. On December the 25th, by the trajectory of the Earth, it is born again. Thirty years after his birth, Jesus goes into the water of John the Baptist. Thirty days after December 25th, the sun appears to move into the sign of Aquarius, the water man. Jesus goes on and picks his disciples from the fishermen. The sun appears then to move into the sign Pisces, the fish. Jesus becomes the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The sun appears to enter into the sign of the Lamb, Aries, which takes away the cold of the winter. He sits at the right hand of the Father in the northern hemisphere. The sun moves to the right side of the eastern sky, and we have summer. And he concludes his career as the Lion of Judah, and the sun concludes its journey in August as Leo the Lion, and we start all over again. That's all it is. But that's everything. Because as it is outside, so it is inside. This is what you're showing. But now what have I got to do? I've got to take you there. I've got to take you to this place. I've got to take you. How am I going to get you to the pineal? How am I going to get you to the place of Christ's birth? If you look on page 10, we're going to have to walk a road. And on page 10 of the material that I gave you, it'll show you uh, that we will walk... A road, see, on the very, on the top part of the page, just above the brain, the cerebrum, it says the stria pinealis. I've got to get you to the stria pinealis. I've got to get you to the straight line because there's a straight line that leads from the pineal gland right to the door of the fornix. Anybody home? To where? When that energy rises up the spine, it hits the pineal, gets on the stria pinealis and goes up that electric circuitry to the fornix where it blows the door, the stone away. In other words, the stone is removed by the angle of electricity. The angle blows the stone away. Right? So I've got to get you there. Now, how am I going to get you there? Your brain waves are electrical waves that carry you right into the very person of what you call God. Huh? Now, let me show you something. Could you turn on the... I want to show you the activity that's going on, the electrical activity that's going on inside of your brain. These are neurons... Oops. These are neurons firing. Do you see? This is... This is the thalamus... And all this stuff is the activity of the neurons, the electrical energy firing in your brain. Can you see that? No. Well, look, can you see it now? They can't see it. We can't see it. 
Oh, okay. Can you see it now? What the, then I will never get it up again. <laughs> Can you see it? Look at it quick. I yeah, and I know, and they, you know, I know what they're talking about, and that's true too. All right. All right. <laughs> Do you see this? Huh? Put it over there. Put it over there. Do you see it now? Yeah. All right. Come on, get back to where we were, because this is important. You're going to blow my whole thing here. All right. Where are we? Now, this is what I wanted to... This is what I wanted to... Where the heck am I? All right. So we see the activity that's going on in the brain. All right? Now, now. This is the way it operates. Just stay with me because, really, I need, to, I need to get you just to see this, then you're out of here. You go in... I'll tell you what you can do. Go to page... Page 32. You start at beta. Okay? <laughs> you start at beta... And, and beta runs 13 to 30 cycles per second. Beta is when you are freaking out, for the most part. <laughs> most of you spend your entire life in beta. Ah, That's where we are. That's why you're taking all of these, these things to calm you down. The second stage is alpha. And alpha runs 8 to 13. Alpha is an awake state, but you're relaxed. Right? You're relaxed in alpha. Okay. Now, this is the important part that I want you to understand. Now you cross the Red Sea to the promised land. When you cross the Red Sea, you go to theta. Notice something interesting. Theta, as it says there, is the eighth letter. It is the symbol for angle, the eighth atom, and if you look in the, what I've got written in there, Luke 2.21, when eight days were accomplished, the child was circumcised. On the eighth day, the coagulation of the blood is stronger, tell me if I'm right, than any other day that you were born. On the eighth day. That's why they circumcised on the eighth day. But this here is coordinated with that because theta is the eighth, and this is where you cut away the flesh. This is where you have the circumcision of the heart. You have now moved from out of the mind to that which is the God mind, to the God consciousness, to the nothingness. You enter into theta. Leviticus 9, on the eighth day, they took the ram and burned the ram. Leviticus 12, 3, circumcised the flesh. Leviticus 23, 36, on the eighth day, a solemn convocation. And this is the good one. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 38. The temple, this you got to see it. Go to page, go to page 297, all right? First Kings chapter 6. We're talking about the completion of this energy that is the brain, the separation from these thoughts that are the brain thoughts. The healing process is going to take place now because what happens? We have completed it. And in the 11th year on the month, bull, which is the 8th month, the house was finished. And how long did it take? He was seven years in building it. Do you see it? The seven of the seven chakra, the eighth, which is the theta, which is the eighth. And there we get into it. So you're cut away. And now you move into the black hole of meditation. When you go into a deep sleep, when you go into a deep sleep, Sometimes you wake up, you don't even know where you are. It happens to me sometimes I start walking the wrong way to the bathroom, you know, and I get off the where I don't know where I am and all this kind of stuff. When you arrive at that point deep into the recesses of the brain, you arrive at Delta. And I've always told you this, my friends. Delta is ready when you are. <laughs> 
Delta, the gentle lulling delta waves, will take you directly to the place. Now look at how you know. How do I know this? Well, look. Let me show you something first. Don't go any further. Don't go any further. But can you see the walls down there? I want to show you something. All right. Can you see? Can you see? Can you see? Can you people there see? Okay. There's a tree in the way. Don't worry about the tree. Up here is beta. This is when you're awake. These are beta waves. This is when you're stressed. This here is your little drowsy, you're going into meditation. These are alpha waves. These here are called random, fast, low voltage REM sleep waves. This is when you're kind of freaking out, but you're asleep. Okay. And you run through that. These are theta waves. This is, a, this is when you're starting to, to move. These are called sleep spindles, where you'll have an integration of regular REM waves or regular awake waves when you're sleeping. And people are tossing and turning and all that kind of business. And then I want to show you, these are delta waves. These are, you ride these waves into the arms of Pia Mater, into the arms of the dark-eyed woman, into the arms of God, okay? Turn the light on. Now, this is what's interesting. I sparred, started this whole thing an hour ago. We talked about the pineal gland. We talked about the fornix. Remember I told you that the fornix is the place where a man dwells. The fornix is the place where the stone is. If you'll stay with me, and if you will come to page 30 to 33, okay? You see delta. If you look at the in anatomy of triangle or surface, which is like, but if you look under that, it says delta fornicus. Do you see that? Go down, delta fornicus is commissura fornicus. Do you see that? Go down to commissura fornicus, the triangle or blah, blah, blah of the right and left fornix, which curve back into the collateral fornix, the commissura fornix. Delta takes you to the fornix. Delta takes you to the stone and rolls it away. Delta takes you to the place of the God. And I didn't confirm this with any New Age stuff. I confirmed it with Stedman's Medical Dictionary. And you've got it. Delta. Why Delta? Triangular shape, yes, but Delta there. Delta there. So as you cross the Red Sea to Theta, and you separate from that which is you, you go to the promised land, which is Delta taken to the Fornix. <laughs> now, I promised to send you out of here. That wasn't bad stuff that we did here. That's not bad. You know what I mean? I mean, it's... Uh... But you know, what I wanted to tell you is this. We started this whole thing with the hippocampus, right? Now stay with me because I'm done here. And, you know, I, we started this whole thing with the hippocampus. We understand that the hippocampus is the place of memory storage, and you can read that in the material that you've got. We found a lot in the hippocampus. We found Peniel, we found Bethlehem, we found Amman, we found Jesus, we found all of them, we found Ram, we found all of these stuff in the hippocampus. And we found the seahorse. Now if you look with me on 16B3, please do. 16B3, because, can I, can I tell you something, for those of you who weren't, why is this important? It says the second coming of Christ in Revelation 19:11 is, Behold, heaven's open, and I saw a white horse. The only white horse in heaven is Pegasus. And on October 1995, scientists in Switzerland found, for the first time in the history of our world, a sun star, which is a twin of ours in our solar system, with a planet orbiting around it, never been seen before, okay? And it was in Pegasus. So something that had never been seen before was in Pegasus. And now what you're sitting here, something which never has been seen before, you've also found inside of you, Pegasus, okay? The hippocampus, Pegasus. Now, we found in 16B3, because Pegasus, if you look at 16B3, Pegasus 
is that seahorse. Okay, that's what the, the hippocampus means, seahorse. Do you see that in 16b3? A seahorse, a sea monster. Then if you go down to Poseidon, it says Poseidon was the father of Pegasus in the third line. So now we've connected them. We've connected that not only have the scientists seen Pegasus out there, but we have seen Pegasus in here, the seahorse, the second coming of Christ. How can we compare that? Because that's where his hem is, and that's where his Bethlehem is. Okay? Now, but I had a problem with this. And let me tell you what my problem is, and then we're going to solve it. My problem is, if you look at page 1013, on page 1013, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, it says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. So I said, well, a white horse? It's a horse, a seahorse, Zeus, Poseidon, it's a white horse. There must be something, right? And I'm going to give you something to take home with you. As they say in the big evangelist place, I'll give you some literature. <laughs> I'll give you some literature. You'll, you'll get a copy of this, which I'm going to show you now. Because I think this... Can you see? I want you to see. This. Can you turn the light off? Where's the engineer? He quit. Okay. <laughs> Gotta call him an engineer. With Kroger Delivery, you don't need a Kroger store nearby to get fresh groceries at low prices. Order on the app and get $25 off your first two orders. It's like we bring groceries from the store to your door. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Are you one of 50% of Americans who can answer this correctly? Let's look at the answer. Seven. It's not about what you know. Oh, my goodness. It's how you think. Do not feel ashamed. You're as stupid as I am. Mondays at 9, followed by the Fox 13 10 o'clock news. <laughs> this is what I want to show you, which is so interesting. Okay? Do you say that? Yeah. Okay. The hippocampus major is a white eminence two inches in length extending throughout there it is the hippocampus major is a white eminence behold the white horse the white horse now if that isn't enough what i want you to do is look on page 16 b3 and on 16b3, this is what it says. It says on 16b3, stuff all over the place. You see the word hippocrine? A fountain on Mount Helicon, the source of poetic inspiration. And look what it says, the Latin hippocrine, hippo source, from the myth that Pegasus' hoof created it. Isn't that neat? But what you're going to take home with you is going to say this. The hippocampus is a white eminence, the white horse. At its lower extremity, it becomes enlarged and presenting two or three rounded elevations. It resembles the paw of an animal and is called the pes hippocampus, the foot of the horse. And Pegasus' hoof of which Jesus rides to return to you in the hippocampus, of which Zeus rides to throw the lightning bolts of enlightenment to you, is in the hippocampus. But you look at this. It's not just hippocampus, the horse. It's hippocampus, the white horse. And as the scripture says, behold, heaven open. I understand within myself there is an opening, and I saw a white horse. Okay? Now, we'll give you these, and you can take these and scare all your friends with them. <laughs> Bill, Did you turn the light on? Bill, yes. Explain the consistency of the pineal gland. The, the pineal gland is, a, is an interesting thing because it calcifies, and it calcifies from not being used. It calcifies at length. 
but uh, in its inception, it's a sandy consistency. What? Huh? Page 666. Yeah, is that interesting or what? Page, is that the hippocampus is on page 60, 666. The hippocampus becomes like a stone, like which is the stone that the, the pineal gland becomes a stone that the builders rejected. And through meditation and in its inception or when it's not used, it becomes like a sandy consistency. But when in meditation it's used, it becomes like a stone-like consistency. And Jesus says, if you build your house on sand, the storm will wash it away. But if you build your house on stone, that this house will survive. So it's talking again about the pineal gland of the brain. But I've showed you the white horse, and I've showed you all of this documentation. And what you're holding in your hands from Gray's Anatomy book says that the hippocampus major is the white horse. Almond's horn is in there. The pyramid is in there. You know the king's and queen's chamber in the pyramid is in there. Everything that you've ever read about, you find is located in your brain. And now you've got scientific documentation to prove it. Other than that, I don't know what else I can tell you today. And we've, we, we, we've done a lot of talking today. And, um, I, I, I just hope that, you know, you take a look at it and see what you come up with. But I think you'll find it extremely interesting. And it's all there. Everything that's ever been written in the journals of religion or spirit are written in a coded message by people who knew thousands of years ago what this was all about. And they waited for you to evolve to the point when you could understand it. And you have evolved to that point. And when you go up the stairs and people ask you what you talk about down in this crazy place, they would never believe you anyhow. But what you're talking about is uh, very adult. It has nothing to do with religion. Thank you. Your gap behind your spigot? <gasps> Our Gorilla Foam Seal. For the toughest jobs on planet Earth. Apartments.com has the most pet-friendly listings. Yeah, pet-friendly listings. I just taught him that. Legend has it, there's a 5,000-year-old book of magic. It was handed down by an Egyptian god and contains spells that can predict the future. It's called the Book of Thoth. And what it says is deeply mysterious. Some say it contains ancient rituals used by secret organizations. Each person who is admitted to the order must die symbolically and be reborn. Others say it offers readers the power to divine the future through tarot cards. The original book of the tarot was really engraved on gold tablets and it was a book of thought. For yet others, the book offers his followers a world of free love and drugs, central to the rock and roll culture of the 1960s. Some of the most famous people in the world, like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, are deeply interested in this sort of thing. But what is the truth about the Book of Thoth? What does it really say? Does it even exist? Now scholars in Egypt are finding the answer. This is the story of the quest to find the truth about what some claim is the most important book ever written. Central London, among the hustle and bustle are bookshops specializing in the occult and esoteric. They sell everything from books on ancient wisdom to magic charms. But one of the most common...
common images is that of an ancient Egyptian god. He's called Thoth, a strange figure with the body of a human and the head of an animal. And on the shelves are copies of his book, the so-called Book of Thoth. 5,000 years after the books of Thoth were originally composed, they are still beguiling modern people. I get asked to talk at conferences where the imagery above the stage, on the name cards, is a figure of Thoth. So who was Thoth? And why does a text from an age dating back to the pyramids exercise such a pull, even today? The answer lies in a tangled tale that started over 2,000 miles away in North Africa. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. The Nile Valley. For years, at sites across Egypt, archaeologists have been uncovering what is probably the greatest civilization of the ancient world. Martin Raven has been digging at a 4,000-year-old burial ground. We have uncovered this vast necropolis full of tombs with beautiful paintings, wall reliefs, inscriptions. Digs like this have revealed that ancient Egypt had a sophisticated culture, a complex belief system, and a pantheon of gods. One of the most important was Thoth. He appears as a human body with the head of an ibis, or as the figure of a baboon. Ancient Egyptian gods were invisible. But if they wanted to manifest themselves to our poor eyes, they, they needed a bodily form. Many gods had a sacred animal that was thought to be connected with them. The baboon, uh, a monkey, looks very wise sometimes, very human-like. He has, must have deep thoughts. So he was connected with the god Thoth. The other sacred animal is the ibis. He's very quiet, he walks through the marshes, through the mud, but uh, he looks as if he also has very deep thoughts. To the ancient Egyptians, Thoth was a god with exceptional powers. Thoth was the secretary of the gods. He noted down what they decided. So he became the god of wisdom, sometimes also the god of healing, and the god of magic. According to legend, Thoth handed down this magic to mortals in a book. It was said to grant its readers amazing powers. Ancient Egyptian literature has it that the book of Thoth contains esoteric or magic wisdom, secret wisdom, that would allow an individual to communicate with the gods, talk to animals, to access the afterlife, these kinds of things. There's a, a wonderful story about uh, a very important magician 
book, found out where this book of thoughts is kept, and he appropriates it. And he suddenly understands the language of other animals. And also, he sees all the stars moving in the sky. He finally understands the, the mechanism that is behind the whole universe. Such was the reputation of the Book of Thoth. Its fame would spread across the ancient world. In the 3rd century BC, the warrior king, Alexander the Great, invaded Egypt. The Greek occupiers were amazed by what they found. They were overawed by this ancient civilization with wonderful buildings, the pyramids, statuary, all of the fabulous stuff that we see today. But then it was in its full glory. They were so impressed, they adopted much of the Egyptian belief system, including some of their gods. One of them was Thoth. The Greeks already had a figure of Hermes, who they believed to be the god who was the patron of what we would call science. He was the inventor of writing, so they came across the figure of Thoth, who the Egyptians believed was also the inventor of all the mathematics, the geometry, which had enabled them to build the pyramids. So the Greeks associated their figure of Hermes with the figure of Thoth from ancient Egypt. The Greeks declared that Thoth and Hermes were the same god. said they also adopted Thoth's book and created a new version, the Corpus Hermeticum. But as they did so, Greek influences crept in. The original Egyptian text and the new Greek text became confused. And so, as Greek culture swallowed Egyptian, Thoth's original text simply disappeared. One legend relates that a last copy of the original book was buried alongside the inquisitive Egyptian magician who'd read it and discovered the secrets of the stars. But whatever the truth, the original Egyptian book of Thoth was lost, replaced by a new Greek version. The original text would not be rediscovered for thousands of years. The Greeks were followed by the Romans. The wisdom of the Corpus Hermeticum was absorbed into early Roman culture. But then came a momentous change. Christianity spread across Europe. References to pagan gods like Thoth and Hermes were banned. The Greek version of the Book of Thoth was suppressed. With the rise of Christianity, and especially with Christianity being adopted by the Roman Empire as the official religion, uh, this older pagan philosophy gets wiped out. Those who advocated pagan ideas were burnt at the stake or broken on the wheel. The general kind of ravages of intolerance 
and conquest uh, led to the loss of the Corpus Medicum. First, the original Egyptian Book of Thoth had vanished. Now the Greek version, the Corpus Hermeticum, disappeared from sight too. Whatever had been written in the Book of Thoth seemed to have been lost forever. But then there was another revolution in Western thinking. In the 1300s, the Renaissance arrived in Italy. It was a time of intellectual ferment and questioning. New ideas were born, and old ones rediscovered. They included the wisdom of classical Greece and Egypt. The very word Renaissance means rebirth, and its first use of it that we find in the 1400s is somebody who says, I seem to see in this new learning the rebirth of the ancient culture. With it came a renewed interest in pre-Christian ideas. If you think of uh, Botticelli's paintings, for example, of Venus and Mars, or the birth of Venus, these are pagan gods and goddesses which are being painted for the first time in Europe for a thousand years. This new interest in the wisdom of the past included the rediscovery of the Greek version of the Book of Thoth, the Corpus Hermeticum. To the Christian culture of the time, it was an explosive find. The Catholic Church had been ruling Europe for over a thousand years. There was a growing sense it was overbearing and overpowerful. The institutions had become terribly corrupt. The office of the Pope had been thoroughly discredited, indulgence were being bought and sold. The, the Church had fallen into a very low respect by even the common people. There was a groundswell of opposition. People began to look back to classical Egypt and Greece for alternative religious inspiration. Somebody brought to Florence the books of Hermes, the Corpus Hermeticum, and the court of the Medici still reeling from the discovery of Plato and the pre-Socratic philosophers suddenly found themselves with these books of Hermes, the books of Thoth, for the first time. The Greek version of the book of Thoth was translated into Latin and published in Italy. It becomes one of the most influential books of the time. It goes into several printings over the next um, century and a half. It may not have been the original Egyptian text, but it spread through the Renaissance world on a wave of optimism. What made the message of this Greek version of the Book of Thoth so exciting was its vision of man's place in the world. For those seeking to challenge the orthodoxy of the church, it came as a revelation. It was a completely different view of mankind, not as a fallen creature who, after being booted out of the Garden of Eden, wandered, lost. The discovery of the books of Thoth was saying, no, man has an exalted position within creation. The message of the book of Thoth seemed to be saying that man was more than a servant to the gods. No 
not only did he have the same powers as the gods, it was his duty to use those powers to create a better world, a more beautiful world. Thoth seemed to offer a new vision of the importance of man's place on Earth. In the books of Thoth, it says that man is halfway between the angels and the animals and has a very special role. He is a co-creator with God and he must create objects of beauty just as God has created objects of beauty. There's this whole idea of optimism about man, about the powers of the mind, the imagination, the ability to understand the world. To many people, the Book of Thoth seemed to offer an intensely attractive vision of mankind. What made this message even more powerful was its age. It seemed to come from a purer time, before the church had been corrupted. If you were a Renaissance man, the idea was formed in your mind that if we could somehow restore this ancient wisdom to its proper place, we could once again live in a pristine world. So what was old was really good. And dating apparently from ancient Egypt, Thoth's knowledge was as old as any in the world. If you think of it as this kind of cascade, you know, this sort of a mountain or lake at the top full of this clear crystal water, and then through the ages, it comes down. It's, it's still the same water, but it gradually gets a bit muddy. And what the philosophers of the Renaissance believed when they had the Corpus Medicum in their hands is they were going to the source. They were going to, you know, sort of the, the, the pure waters of, of the ancient knowledge. Yet the irony was that this whole alternative philosophy 